<laughs> and the, but the first thing I want to say is really thank you very much for having us here today. It's absolutely, it's lovely to be here in this wonderful library and um, in this lovely warm room. We've been keeping our heating off in our house and it's actually extremely lovely to be here. Um, so thank you, thank you for being here. And so obviously I'm, I'm Nikki Gerard. And I'm Sean, and we're going to try and handle this. No, right. <laughs> <laughs> and we're, and, and we're, and we're Nikki, Nikki French. Um, and we thought what we do today is we talk about what it is to be, who, who Nikki French is, you know, how we started off, how we write, the kind of books we write, and then maybe end up just talking in a little bit more detail about our latest book. Um, but, but hope that the kind of the real meat of the matter will be in the conversation, the unexpected at the end, so. <clears throat> so we thought first, first we, we say a bit about what we did before uh, we, uh, Nicky French happened. So I grew up in, in North London in, uh, and actually I, I, oh, <laughs> right. uh, I never really thought of doing anything apart from writing or some, something in my, uh, or I just wanted to do something involving writing or the arts. I was my um, I, I grew up in a, in a house full of books. I suppose the, the influence from that side. My father was a was a journalist, and in fact he was he was people both did he was a producer at the on BBC Radio and was probably better known. He was the film critic of the Observer for quite a few years. So we, I grew up, you know. Uh, being actually ordered to go out to see certain films, saying, you know, you've got to go out now, you know, don't sit there doing your homework, you know, go out and see this important film. Uh, and anyway, so I, I um, you know, uh, I, uh, I then went to, I left, so went to university, and actually Nikki and I were at the same university doing the same subject at the, at the same time, and, and never met. Uh, Which might have been just as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think we met at the right. So we often have the conversation about if we. So we met when I, you know, ten years later. Where, you know, whether I think there's a kind of karma there. I think Nikki wouldn't have, uh, wouldn't quite have liked me so much at twenty years. You know. Uh, as, I think, anyway, uh, that is another story, and that should be from my therapist, not for this audience here in Maidstone. Uh, so I, I um, yeah. So I did studied English at university, and again had no. I was amazed looking around at people I knew who all seemed to have big plans for um, for what they wanted to do after they, uh, when they left university. I had no plans whatsoever, except and the, all the only constructive thing I did was in my final year, completely randomly, I went in for a. I happened to pick up. I was in someone else's house, picked up a, a copy of Vogue magazine for the first time in my life, and saw that there was a competition for, for young writers, and I thought, okay, I'll go in for that, and I. I went into this competition and I was lucky enough to win the competition. And the, very bizarrely, I then got a job on Vogue, which is, <laughs> you can see. <laughs> you can see. <laughs> but, but of course, I think I was the worst dressed person ever in the. So anyway, so, and via that, I, I found myself being a journalist. So I spent my 20s doing every kind of journalism. Not, but when I say every kind, I didn't do any political journalism. I wasn't running to report on fires. I was just, I was, you know, commissioning book reviews, reviewing films and theatre and all that sort of stuff. But I never, in that whole period, I still have, I, my, my ambition was to write books. But in the, until I met Nikki, for reasons we might get onto, I never finished anything longer than like a 1500 word article. But then, and then, and then um, at the, uh, uh, I found myself working when I was approaching 30, I was working, uh, uh, writing a, a weekly column on the New Statesman magazine, where I happened to meet... <laughs> he happened to meet me with my two tiny little children. I mean, like Sean, I... I mean, I, unlike Sean, I did not grow up in a house of writers or of books, really. There were very few books in our house, but my mother used to read to all of us. I mean, I think about this now, you know, as a parent and now as a grandparent, that thing about being read to and the joy of stories. So we would come back from school 
and for like an hour and a half at tea time, she would read us books. She would read us kind of children's books and poetry. And, I, you know, some of the kind of most formative reading experience of my life was those almost pre-verbal memories of being read to and looking at pictures. And like Sean, I grew up... I didn't grow up in London, but I grew, I grew up in the countryside, but I grew up just kind of addicted to stories and to, to reading them and to writing them and and with that lovely child self and kind of lack of self-consciousness about the act of writing and we sometimes we now go into schools and do creative writing classes for little kids and until they get to the age of like maybe 10 or 11 they just know that they can write they love writing they know their ideas are wonderful and then horribly when they get towards kind of adolescence this kind of embarrassment and self-consciousness sets in and they lose that kind of glorious confidence in the power of the imagination anyway I grew up really wanting to be a writer but also like I had a much more roundabout route into that than Sean so I went to the same university as Sean and as Sean says we did not meet um, and then I worked with a kind of a, I worked in a children's home with little children who had had terrible starts to their life and was very moved by it and also rather bad at my job I think probably because <laughs> I was moved by it rather than thinking about how you know I just went around being moved by it and, and disobeying rules. And then I left and I did a second degree and I taught adult education for a bit and I did... I, I, I was a co-founder and co-editor of a books and arts magazine for kind of women's books and arts briefly to, for two years. And then, and then I got pregnant and I had a baby, not with Sean. Um, I was married by this time, yeah. Um... And and then and I was just doing lots of odd bits and pieces. My mar and then I had another baby, also not with Sean. Um, and then my marriage ended, and I so I'd got a job um, working as the stand-in literary editor on the New Statesman. Um, and so then and then who was waiting there? Well, actually, not waiting there. Who was there? I had with no and and actually at the time, I was absolutely not wanting to see a man, kind of be with a man or anything. I was kind of quite bruised and battered. I had these two tiny little children. They were less than one and just two. So they were really miniature. Mm -hmm. um, and I was struggling with childcare and probably feeling quite angry and sore. And the first time that I... Actually, Sean and I did meet previously. We met very briefly, we later remembered, we met at a book launch. Um, this should have been a warning. We met at a book launch and we had a very, quite a nice conversation about deadlines. And I was saying how I was very good at meeting, de too good at meeting deadlines. And Sean said he was very bad at meeting deadlines. In fact, he never met deadlines. And he used to bake bread. In, whenever a deadline was coming up, he used to kind of go and bake bread. Um, and I later discovered that this was true and actually if I came home and there was the lovely smell of baking bread it was very ominous <laughs> anyway but the first real the first time kind of after that that we met was when I came into the New Statesman very soon after I'd begun there and my childminder hadn't turned up so I had these two tiny children and I had to tow them into the New Statesman offices um and that was probably quite good. So Sean didn't just meet me, he met my my world as well. So he knew he knew who I was, he knew what I came with. Anyway, we, uh, so we uh, we got we got together very we'll actually talk about we may get to back to this in a second. We got we got together and moved in together extremely quickly and uh, and uh, very, and then about two years later we had two more children. So we had four children and uh, we, we we were we were sort of struggling, well, I don't know about struggling journalists, we were certainly struggling to pay the mortgage journalists. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and at that point, <clears> that I, that very generously, that Nikki made this, we made the decision that, that you know, that, because I wanted to, you know, that fi it was weirdly, having never written uh, um, books before, I suddenly, I thought, now is the time, you know, now that there was no time, we had four children, no money. So the decision was I would that Nikki would actually take on more of the work, even more of the work. So and I would 
to gradually do less journalism. And I, so for, for the next two or three years, I wrote a motley collection of books on my own. I wrote, uh, uh, I wrote two, no, two novels myself. I wrote um, uh, a couple of biographies, including a biography of Brigitte Bardot. The, the, uh, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I remember a key moment. I had to write it very quickly, and so it involves sort of um, what um, I had to very quickly watch lots of Bridget Bardot films. It was to, the book was coincided; it had to be delivered to be published for her six, what was it, I think her sixtieth birthday. And uh, and I remember Nikki had be, f being forced to sit next to me and watch a video of and God created woman. And uh, at some point of it, I, I, I sort of turned to her and said, "Well, you've got to admit she's very attractive." And Nikki said, "There's this very stony silence." And Nikki then said, "I feel very alienated from you just now." <laughs> <laughs> so this is a this is, anyway. Um, having ha having um, uh, finished my second book. And there's a strange book. I think about writing books is, you know, you finish the book and then what are you going to do next? And we, we had, Nikki and I had talked for, you know, because we were the two, we were both journalists. So we were frantically writing in the same house. And whenever I wrote anything, I'd always show it to Nikki before I sent it to an editor. And we were all, you know, we were certain, we were used to passing our writing back and forwards. And we were also, we, we, you know, it was the same with our reading. We'd re share books. If there was something we loved, we'd give it to the other one to read. And we'd, you know, and we we gradually, it wasn't, it wasn't a, a particular moment, but we started having a kind of conversation about, you know, we're both writers. Would, you know, would it be possible to try and write something together, you know, as a, you know, and maybe something that would actually feel like one voice. And it was just one of those sort of pipe dreams, and you'll, you'll do it one sometime in the future. And just around the time when I'd finished my second book, we both read an article in, the, uh, in, the, in a magazine about the, what was it? So this would have been in like 1994, uh, uh, a, about this sudden big new controversy about the surrounding this issue of what's called recovered memory. So what it was was that women were almost entirely women were going into therapy for just you know just no, fairly normal therapy, and they would recover you know memories they had no, they would compl had been completely unconscious of horrendous abuse when they were children, and as a result uh, this was mainly happening in America and as a result of this, uh, people were actually being sent to prison with no other evidence apart from these memories you know getting you know uncles and you know neighbours and fathers were getting long jail sentences. And so there was a, obviously a huge argument about how reliable were these memories. And Nikki and I, I think, uh, being writers, we had, this, I think, a very typical uh, writer's reaction, which was, on the one hand, we acted like human beings and said, what a sad, tragic case this was. And the other one, we thought, Christ, this is a really good idea for a book. <laughs> for a, we could write a thriller using this idea. And it, what was very, in a way, what was really useful about this, it was because it was suddenly this thing that was in the news, and it was very. Con we thought someone's going to be writing their the recovered memory thriller, so we better get down to it straight away. So we, so it gave us a real urgency at a completely mad time. We had both do, were doing full time jobs, you know. We we were you know st struggling to pay the mortgage every month. Not a terrible idea to na for, to, to sit down and write our novel, but in a way, there's a kind, there's a kind of moral there that I think to anyone who's thinking. Be, be, lots of people have plans. One day I'm going to write my book, you know, when I'm in the right place, when I've got the right time. It's never going to be the right time. If you want to write your book, write it tomorrow. Or today. I, I, you know, <laughs> tomorrow is not the right thing. Anyway, so, that, so the question was then, how do we actually do something as weird as that? And just to add that actually after the Memory Game was published, we were at a, very shortly after we were at a party and this writer came up to us and he was very grumpy with us and he'd been halfway through his recovered memory book when ours came out. So it was like we were, we were right to get a move on. Um, yes, yeah, so how do we do it? In fact, that the method that we cobbled together then is the method that basically we still use today because I think for us there is no other way especially because we want to be writing into one voice the voice that we've tried to kind of the, the voice of Nikki French this mysterious other person in our relationship and what we never do and never and never can do is write together we don't sit down and write a book together so what we do is we spend weeks and months fighting 
working out what the book is. So coming up with the idea. And that involves often discarding lots of ideas. And both of us have to be equally committed to the idea. So the kind of beating heart of the book, the kind of what the journey of the book is, what the kind of plot points are, who the characters are, what the kind of tone of the book is. And we'll do that. We go for long, long... A lot of our best planning is done going for long walks. Um... You know, sometimes all day we'll walk and just tramp the countryside and just talk things out. And we gradually refine it down so we both know what book it is, that it's the same book that we each have in our imaginations. And that doesn't mean that we have to have... It's not kind of detailed chapter synopsis by chapter synopsis. It's like where we're going with the book. And then once we've got that, one of us will begin. And we never decide in advance who that one is. Um just as we do all the work and the research together. We just, it could be either of us beginning. And then that one will go to his or her study. And actually we work as far from each other as we possibly can. So I work right at the top of the house in this attic and Sean works in a, in a shed in the garden. It's a very nice shed, but it's as far from me as it can be. And one of us will write the first, say, chapter, and then we'll email it. And the emailing is quite important as well. We'll email it to the other who is absolutely free to add to it, to edit it, and even, you know, or to erase it and rewrite it. And in the service of Nikki French, um, that, that, that last bit is quite painful, but it also can be necessary. And then they will write the next, say, chapter and email it back. So we pass it back and forward like that. And the real key thing to know about the method and we didn't even work out these rules. They weren't kind of they weren't rules we wrote down in advance. It's the only way we could do it. We couldn't sit next to each other, kind of trying to work out sentence by sentence. Because, you know, as most of us, you know, anyone who's written anything almost knows it's a strange, weird, unexpected process. And it involved kind of going down into the kind of mysterious recesses of the mind and letting the world go behind and as soon as you start doing it with some or as soon as we start doing it with each other it becomes kind of self-conscious and awkward and inhibited so it wouldn't work so the big thing is that it's not a power struggle it's not that I'm writing as Nikki Gerard and sending it off to Sean to kind of add a bit of Sean French to um, it's it's about trusting that the other person we're, we're, it's not a kind of ego battle we're both writing in the service of Nikki French and we're both having to be edited and changed by the other and we're both having to look ridiculous in front of the other and to try things that might not be working um, so it's a very kind of it's quite a delicate process but it just involves this level of trust um, yeah I mean, some people um some people have said, well, you, you must have been so lucky that the two of you met with this matching prose style, that you, know, you must be such similar writers. And this, the weird thing about that is that uh, it could not be further from the truth. I think when, Nikki, when we do our own separate work, we have got really different styles, different interests. And I think one of the things, I mean, the, I should say, that I think when we, when we wrote the, um, the, 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 what became the memory game, the first book, is I think we... We certainly, there was no, to say the least, there was no plan we were going to have a full career being a crime novelist called Nicky French. We, did, we weren't even sure it would be, we'd finish the book. We weren't even sure that it would be remotely publishable because simply because it was so odd, the idea of the collaboration. And I think, that there, I think once we got about a third of the way through, we did have a feeling, there was a feeling you get with a book, and that's a kind of the wonderful bit of writing. We think this is actually, is taking, this is sort of, this is sort of work. It's like a plant that's growing. This is sort of working. And also, I think, the one thing that... The, why, one of the reasons why we've carried on doing it uh, is the... I think there's a thing we had not anticipated at all, that there was a kind of weird freedom. I think some people have, have said to, to, either, to us separately, you know, isn't it... Don't you feel... Isn't it constricting having to be kind of compromising? You know, you're working with someone else and, you know, uh, it's not just your book. But I think the, the, there's something weirdly unexpectedly freeing about that about that I think we what we both found is that um uh you, we were we somehow became a different writer so you so it's like going 
you know, they had the image of going to a carnival, wearing a mask, and you can do things you can't do in your normal life. And I think that somehow when we collaborate as Nikki French, I feel I definitely feel I'm a different kind of writer, and I can write in a different way that I don't write as myself. And that's very mysterious. Even after all this time, I still find it hard to explain exactly why that should be. But we did. The, I mean, I have to say we've known other people who've tried. I think some we had some friends, different friends, couples who knew us. And when we did, when they heard we'd done our first book, they thought, well, if, if they can do it, we could do it. And in both times, they had. It just did not work at all. They wrote a little bit, and uh, I mean, one, in fact, one particular couple, he was slightly more the, the journal, more a writer than she was. But he thought they'd, they, they had the idea of collaborating, and they had this, uh, uh, as it turned out, disastrous idea of writing an erotic novel together. And the, and the plan was that he would, she would supply the erotic scenario, and then he would write the, the actual book. And I think she was rather doubtful of it. But she finally did supply this. And he immediately, when he saw what her erotic scenario was, he went into a huge sulk. They had a massive argument. And, then, <laughs> and, then, and that was the end of their book. And in fact, I, I think very often that people, I think that people, one of the things about collaboration, as Nikki said before, is it mustn't, um, it mustn't, there must be no feeling of a power struggle. That when, you know, when I write some, an absolutely perfect, beautiful paragraph, and by the time it comes back, it's been removed or completely rewritten. It, if I felt, if I'd always felt that Nikki had from the beginning a book in her mind that she was kind of trying bit by bit to edge it towards and away from the idea of mine that she'd never quite liked but wasn't really going to say it. it was just, you know, if there was that kind of... I mean, the way I describe it, I'm sounding as if I feel it. But, uh, <laughs> uh, no, but I, I think if there was ever a feeling of that, we would just... We, we, at a very early stage, we'd have ground to a halt, which is why the kind of... You know, which is why we just have... You know, so, if, and, so in those circumstances, you know, that I'm just not... I mustn't then... Put, it, put back in my beautiful sentence that's been cut. You know, you've just got to, to suck it up. Anyway, I should say, so we, with the very first book, so we, you know, when we, um, we were, so when we first wrote it and handed it, in fact, to our agent, who was the first person to read it, it did say by Sean French and Nicky Gerrard, and we, but we were absolutely clear we always wanted to, that it would be that this would, we wanted to have one name on the cover. Because there was just we, we had the feeling that if you're reading a novel, it's one thing when you read a, journal, a book of journalism or history written by two people, and you can see how different views are reflected in that. But we had this feeling that when you're re reading a novel, you, ha you always feel that it's one person talking to you. And, and having, I mean, sometimes I felt that the worst readers of our books are, are like family and friends because they just cannot stop themselves from saying, do you know, that character, isn't that someone a bit like someone Nikki used to know? Or, or that sentence, that sounds like Sean, you know. And that, that is so much, by the time anyone else gets to read the book, we've both gone over it so much that even we're not clear about who's written what. And so we really wanted to feel that it was one, you know, that readers would feel there's this person called Nikki French talking to them. And there is this person, Nikki French, talking to them. So, the, and so, uh, but, but we, so we, we, kept, we tried, we spent f f terrible days coming up with preposterous names and, and doing, you know, in different ways. And in the end, we just had this brilliant idea of taking Nikki's first name and my second name. And I'll just say very quickly, last thing, that we, it had to be a woman because, and it's almost by chance, uh, because, um, this, the, you know, the, the, the subject of the, the memory game, of recovered memory, happened almost entirely to women. So this book was told, had to be told in the first person by a woman. So it just felt logical to, to call it a woman's name. So suddenly we found ourselves a female writer. Maybe there's a kind of Sean Gerrard lurking somewhere, waiting to be let out. I mean, who knows? And I guess that brings us to kind of, you know, who is Nikki French? Or what, what are the, you know... What marks Nikki? What makes Nikki French Nikki French? And we've talked about this a lot. I mean, we don't exactly know what Nikki French looks like or anything like that, but we absolutely know that Nikki French has a kind of, you know, writing personality. So sometimes, if Sean comes up with an idea, or if I come up with an idea, we'll just think that's a good idea, but it's just not a Nikki French idea. And I'm trying to kind of think what I mean by that. I guess the first thing I'd say is that. It's, we write about, we write psychological thrillers. You could say we write about kind of things that happen to ordinary people, kind of extraordinary things that happen to ordinary people. And part of the journey of the novel is not just the plot, it's like what then happens to them, how that works itself out in their mind. We write about domestic 
things, domestic dread. We often say that we're not going to run out of storage because you just go to any family, e you know, even the happiest family, you've got enough subjects for thrillers to last you a lifetime. Come round to ours at breakfast, you know, that will keep us going. It's just, so we're trying, we, what, what, we, what we're always interested in doing is taking kind of, is taking almost humdrum everyday subjects or things that everybody knows, you know, what is it like to feel jealous? What is it like to feel a bit scared? What is it like to, 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 feel, to feel grief? What is it like to be anxious when you walk down a road? And then we just take those subjects and we just turn the ratchet a bit so it becomes a thriller. And most of our... Yeah, I will. I mean, most of our... Most of our Plots. Most of our stories come out of. They don't come out of reading true crime books or newspaper stories, or certainly other people's thrillers because they've done it already. They come. It comes out of the conversations or sometimes the arguments that we're having that we cannot let go of. The kind of what ifs. The what does this mean? The things that make us anxious, that make us feel obsessed, that unsettle us, that we don't, that we haven't, we can't make our minds up about, if you like. So I'll think if I think of a few obvious examples of that. The first, in a way, almost the most obvious example is our third book. I mean, one of the things that we should say is that when we wrote this book, we suddenly discovered we had a two-book contract, and we said that was rather surprising, because we'd written one book, we thought, oh no, now we've got to write another book. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, our third book, we were about halfway through writing a thriller that was going okay. Um, you know, there were a few problems with it, and we were pushing against, you know, a, 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 a kind of few barriers, but it was going okay. And then we were actually in a car driving, in fact, to see my mother who we thought was dying although actually she's still alive now so she were and we were talking about how we met and as Sean described it earlier when we met it was very very quick and neither of us were expecting it or ready or I certainly wasn't ready for it and we very quickly moved in together I got pregnant we got married, we had two more little children, and we did all of these things before we knew each other properly. So before we knew if we could trust each other, we had trusted each other. And we were talking about how that was like going a bit mad, and in fact how falling in love is like going mad, and how almost every couple you meet, you know, however kind of settled and respectable they are, and how they've kind of built up, you know, they've got jobs and mortgages and cars and children and plans and cleaning rotors. And then there's a little vortex of madness at the heart of each, all of those sensible relationships. And then we thought, we've got to write about that, about the madness of falling in love and about how what happens if you don't go back into kind of ordinary life after that madness. So we came up with the idea of, of a couple who kind of fall giddily in love with each other. And then it turns out, because this is a Nicky French thriller after all, that she should not have, she should not have trusted him. She should not have kind of laid open her heart before she knew what he was like. Um, so that's one example. I'm thinking that another example is a, is a, a novel we wrote several years later, several novels later, called Losing You. Um, and for years, we carried around this, like, this incredibly simple idea of, of, a mother, of a mother, of a child who goes missing. I mean, it's one, you know, and we just thought that nightmarish thing of what happened if a child goes missing. And we just couldn't think of how to make that work as a whole novel. And then eventually we came up with the idea, if the child is a teenager who goes missing. So she's, Charlie is 15 and she's gone missing for like an hour or two. And obviously the police aren't going to take that seriously, but the mother knows it's serious. And then we thought, what if we set it in real time? So, because, because if you're anyone who knows when a child, when a little child or any child goes missing, every single second counts is like a torment. Um, so we, we set it in real time. So every second is accounted for in that novel. You do not leave the central consciousness. Everything that happens to her, every thought that goes through her mind, you're with her. So it takes, the kind of novel takes like eight hours or nine hours to read, and it takes that long. The action takes place over that time. And then we thought, what if it's set on a little peninsula that when the tide comes up, it 
becomes an island. So you get this sense of the waters closing in and it's beca- it's like this kind of absolute claustrophobia of place. And then we also decide to set it on the shortest day of the year. So the light is fading. So everything is closing in with the action. And then once we've had those ideas, then we knew how to make the, to make the novel work. I mean, actually, I, mean, I was just thinking while well, listening to Nikki just say this, is in a way, one of the things about ideas, they're kind of simple and humdrum in a way. There's a, Alfred Hitchcock used to tell this story about um, a Hollywood producer, this is not a true story, I think, uh, but he'd, this producer wakes up in the middle of the night and he's got the most brilliant idea for a hit film, absolutely, this is going to be the greatest film, he goes back to sleep and then he wakes up in the morning and he's completely can't remember it. he's forgotten the idea so he so the next night he, he again he ha, he wakes up has this brilliant idea and uh, wakes up in the night wakes up in the morning and he's forgotten it again so he has this great idea he says, I'll, I'll get a notebook and a pen by my bed so you know and so that i'll be able to remember it so the next night wakes up in wakes up has a phenomenal idea jots it down writes it down goes back to sleep wakes up in the morning completely forgotten he says great I've got my notebook and he picks up the notebook and says boy meets girl and <laughs> and, and you know but that's a you know, but boy meets girl is a great is a great idea and there were, I mean lots of our I mean, I mean to take I was going to say very quickly one other idea which is I mean the, 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 one, I mean one of the reasons we we never tell people in advance what we're working on is because often people think well, that seems pretty simple, you know. So, well, one, but but it's something in a way. It's going back to Nikki talking about falling in love. We're, what we're we're talking about ideas all the time. Every, you know, could this be a story? Could that be a story? You know, we hear something, or we think of something, or think of some problem. And for some reason that you can't put your finger on, that one of them you fall in love with. You think this is a story that this this something is got under our skin, and this is something we're willing to spend a whole year with. So there was another. I mean, one, one thing we often talk about is how close. Um, uh, rom-coms are to psychological thrillers. I mean, you can do a kind of exercise. If you think of your favourite rom-com, the kind of behaviour that ha- always happens to that, like turning up at offices unannounced, or going at, meeting someone in a re- you know, suddenly turning up at a restaurant and, sing- and singing, at, singing to them in front of everyone. If, that, that, if that's someone you're going to fall in love with, that's wonderful. But if it's someone you're creeped out by, that's n- absolutely nightmarish. <laughs> and so we had the, so one idea we had, uh, we, which... Um, uh, called, a book called Secret Smile about this woman who has a very brief affair with someone and then finally just, I don't really like him, breaks up with him and he decides he won't leave. He just will not leave. He will not stop seeing her. And if it was starring Hugh Grant or something, it could be a charming kind of, you know, thing. and it's, I think it's one of the kind of creepiest stories we've ever written because it's about someone who infests a family by, by just not, by, by refusing to go. Um, so, hey, but maybe, so maybe at this point we could uh, talk sure, about... Yeah, we could talk about, yeah. Or maybe just very I was saying, briefly yeah. mention the series. And then just very oh, oh, sure. sure. Just very, very briefly say, we, had, we wrote 12 standalone first narrator thrillers, and we always thought that we'd just write standalones. Um, and then we met Frieda Klein, who's a psychotherapist. We came up with this idea. We thought we'd have a woman who's a psychotherapist who believes in solving the kind of mess and chaos of the self rather than the mess and chaos of the outside world. And she, she's rather reclusive and she really doesn't want to be any kind of detective. She's like a detective of the mind, but that's the only thing she has an interest in. And we wanted to drag her out, poor thing, into the world. Um, and because well, the more we talked about Frida, we thought she just won't yield herself properly in one book she needs more than a book for us to know who she is and so then we thought well she needs eight books I'm not quite sure but seven but but all named after the days of the week which doesn't quite make sense but anyway so we did we spent nearly a decade writing a series um at the center there was this kind of damaged honorable difficult woman called Frieda Klein, who, who we still miss, actually. She was like our very stern, unyielding conscience who made us feel guilty about ourselves all the time. Um, and, and she would walk around London, and we would walk around London with her to the strangest areas that there are. Um, and, but the, that series had to come to an end. It was, it was always going to be eight books. It was always going to have this one overarching story which would come to a climax in, in book eight, Day of the Dead. And so since then, we've written... Now I'm struggling. To, we've written five. We've gone back to writing 
standalones. And we've always said that we won't write a series unless there's a reason to, like Frida was our reason then. So since then we've wrote, written five standalones, but actually not with first-person narrators now. They've mostly had third-person narrators. And maybe we should just briefly say what the latest is, and then, and then you can ask us lots and lots of questions, I hope. Okay. Um, the, I mean... One th I think one th maxim we have is, especially the whole, what's so fascinating for us about the, the genre of the psychological thriller is basically a I think anything can be turned into a psychological thriller, and we've uh, our, um, over the years. I mean, we've never we've never written a kind of you know six days to hunt down a terrorist who's got a bomb. Is is what about people who you know our maxim is our our, our usually our heroines. They don't they're people they don't know they're in. It. Sometimes when you read other thrillers, you feel from the beginning people somehow know they're in thriller land. They know they're in a thriller world, and we we want we always want people they don't realise they're in a thriller. They want to be in another kind of story, and um, we've so we've tended to often we've drawn very often on little things from our own life, and, you know, and. Um, for 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 the for the, um, for the unheard, the, uh, you know, I'm sure we've, you know, anyone who's had children or you know been with children know the experience of a very small child who comes back with a completely un unintelligible drawing from um, uh, from school and then gives some completely chaotic description of what this drawing actually stands for, and uh, we were sort of. You know, actually, our children, as Nikki was saying, are all grown up now. But um, uh, we, I think we were just talking about that, and of course, we thought you could make a thriller out of that. So the I, this, the beginning of the book, or the, the, later the germ. Before, there's not exactly how the book begins, but the germ of this idea was: what if your three-year-old comes back from school, and they don't? They seem. They see. It seems to be a. Or in fact, not in this case, not from school, from from being away for a couple of days, and the, the the drawing seems to show that they've witnessed a murder, and that was we thought that was that, it was that idea grabbed us, and so that, that's what, and then so we thought the the kind of story, so we the, so what it's about is this newly separated uh, woman with her small child, and so she's in this kind of unstable new life, but which she thinks she's managing very well, and this her child. Poppy uh, has done this drawing, but the, it looks like that she's she's seen somehow seems to be aware of a crime that she's done this terrifying drawing of, and she's clearly being she's acting in a disturbed way. But of course, she can't. Three year olds can't be a proper witness, so she can't. When she, as soon as the mother starts questioning about her, she becomes absolutely unintelligible, and there doesn't seem to have been a murder committed. And then so, this mother then has to decide how to handle it and. Things don't go very well, sadly. <laughs> being again, being a Nicky French story. Yeah. In fact, the real inspiration, the kind of the, the literal inspiration for the book, the book, we were remembering how we went to we went to the Wembley Stadium once or something to see some show, and it was at the time of mad, when mad cow disease was a great fear, and Sean insisted on eating this really cheap and horrible looking burger in spite of one of his children pleading with him not to. And then a few days later, she came home from school and there was this violent red scribble. And then underneath in the teacher's writing, it said, Daddy with mad cow disease. So. <laughs> <laughs> and our, our poor children who uh, have been used every stage of their lives. <laughs> we, well, very, we are very vampiric, and so we tend to be... You know, you should be getting anyone be careful what you say here, because we're <laughs> liable to find our way, find its way to the story. And and now I think we're really hoping that you have, there's a mic there, and that you may have questions for us. There we are. Good. Um, you mentioned um, domestic, uh, domestic situations, and and one thing I wanted to ask you about is the. Um, the sort of what I describe as the domestic signature that some of your heroines have. So for Fr Frida, it's the sort of the muse house and the austere sort of surroundings and the charcoal. And then I think you've got another character who goes shopping a lot for food <laughs> whenever she's a bit conflicted. Or so you've got these. I, I I don't know if this comes in at the beginning with your character or if it's something that. That's I love that question because that thing about about the domestic theme. It's, it's, 
we talk a lot when we when we're planning the book, and then certainly when we're writing, especially when we're feeling our way into the fir- in, in the first few chapters of writing, is it's about detail. You have to absolutely know your world and your characters, and not just the central characters, but all the characters who think they're the central characters, but actually they're the cameos and things. Is that I mean, I always think that you learn as much about someone from opening their fridge or looking under their bed or just the kind of absolute, the gritty detail about what a house smells like, about what someone cooks for comfort. I mean, we do a lot of cooking ourselves and in talking about, I mean, food. Just the, the things that are really important. I mean, often people think what's important. You know, when they describe what's important, they'll describe big emotions and their kind of political views or whatever. But actually just the tiny little things about what you do when you're feeling sad you know do you go shopping do you drink a glass of whiskey do you go for a swim what it feels like to be like that that and so actually one of the big things that we talk about when we're planning is where it has to be set you know what the house looks like what the street is like when you walk out onto it and that's the way you get and under the skin of a character, and, prob- and we hope under the skin of a reader as well. And so there's something about the way people, the way people kind of care for each other by tiny gestures, for instance, or the way they don't care for each other. I mean, also acts of cruelty. Acts of cruelty are often tiny, suggestive things. And and there's a law of diminishing returns. If you have big, grotesque acts of cruelty, that is often much less telling than the tiny little kind of psychological flourishes that happen that we all know about that we all know what it's like to we all you know if I think a lot about you know and we've we've written a fair bit about children and children's imagination that thing about being at school and being bullied what is it like it's not just about being pushed around it's about tiny little kind of the eyebrow that's raised the tone of voice and I guess that's what it is to write psychological thrillers it's those kind of niche granular things yeah, i'll just add one thing which is that I mean, those details are so important so uh, uh, it was really important with frida right from the beginning that she walks around that she mm-hmm. because she her, her, there's a kind of turmoil inside her head and she just gets she deals with it by walking long walk through london in the middle of the night and but and, and it was but the very the first book, the Lying Room, the first book we wrote after the Frida series, it was really important that the the, the, the main character there was a cycle cycles around them because she, she's partly her life is falling apart, so she has to get she doesn't have time to walk. She's basically having to dash so quickly between things, and but cycling would have been completely wrong for Frida because it's not a kind of med, you know uh, Nikki and I do both both walking and cycling, and they're different. You know, cycling is not meditative in the way that uh, it's not a way of clearing your head. It's certainly not if you cycle in London, but uh, so, so yeah, so we. It's things that come like that come out as, at a really early stage about we you know the, the details. Can I, so this is really one question for the whole time. So one, I mean, one of the things that you know what we do with our protagonist, our female protagonist, is, and we talk about this quite a lot because it worries us sometimes. So we have to keep an eye on it. We're kind of tormenting them. We're taking people we like and care about, and then we're putting them through hell, really, and we're kind of dismantling their lives and, 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 and watching, observing how they behave. And so one of the things that we talk about when we're observing how they behave is how do people hold themselves together? And, how, and we think, you know, how do people keep going when it feels like it's almost impossible to keep going? Where do they find their strength from? I mean, in a very trivial way, if I'm feeling really stressed, I I will need to go swimming. I will need to put myself into water. Or I'll need to bake I'll bake something, something that's some kind of magic rising in the oven. And there, and it's these and actually you you learn about people by how they kind of try and hold this very fragile kind of fragile story of themselves together thank you (laughs) obviously you know I work in a prison library and the ladies in East Sutton Park said to me that House of Correction was the book that was most accurate in depicting their life when they arrived in a prison and I just wondered how you got that without actually experiencing it yourself that's almost the 
best thing that anyone has ever said about him. Because it, it felt like a huge thing to be doing, to be writing, as if we knew about what it was like to be inside a prison, which, of course, we don't. And, and, you know, and in fact, when we started, House of Correction is a book that's the first half... It's almost like a mock-up. It was like smashing through two genres. We had the kind of prison genre, and then we had a court drama at the end of it. And this character, Tabitha, who's in... she's Tabitha is in prison, and she's been accused of a crime. And she's trying to work out what actually happened from within the prison. So that was the challenge we set ourselves, how she could find out how she got into prison while being in prison. Um... And we took a character who was quite depressed, very kind of at rock bottom. And then we took her even further rock bottom. And it's her fight, her fight to escape from prison, but also her fight to escape from the kind of the prison of her depression and her sense of despair. And what we did, so first of all, we have been into prisons a fair amount of time. We've done prison reading groups and we've kind of visited prisons. Um, I actually spent two days once in Broadmoor when I was writing for The Observer. Um, and then we've read lots of books about, written by people who have been in prison. Um, and we've talked to kind of judges and people who know a lot about prison. We've kind of tried to do as much research as possible. And there's a kind of tyranny, I mean, you need to do enough research so that you can imagine it. Um, you need to create a world that you know what that world is and then you hope you've got it right. And that's, in a way, that's all I can say. We thought of the character Tabitha. We found out as much as we could. We did lots of research, lots of reading from all different sides of it, from people who worked in prisons to people who had been in prisons to people who kind of were trying to reform prisons. And then we just had to take our character Tabitha and put her in that situation and just try and work out what she would make of it, try and imagine it ourselves. And it's just very, very, a great relief to know that they think it worked. <laughs> because, of course, we, you know, all I can say from having been there, been visiting prisons, is that it feels like nowhere else. And people who say prisons are too easy, or <laughs> just that feeling of walking into prison, even for an hour or two, and the door's shutting behind you and trying to imagine what it would feel like if they weren't going to open up again for you anytime soon. It's really hard for a member of staff who doesn't get locked up. Yeah. You imagine what it's like, how horrible it is. Actually. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just. I mean, I think people will say who often people who's writing biographies. In fact, I, I, I you know, I, I didn't. I didn't have time with Bridget Bardot, but did with another biography. I did. People always say, if you possibly can, go to all the places you where the person, um, where, where the person lived, and the, you just. There's no substitute for it standing in a place and getting a feel for it. And that's even. I mean, it's amazing. You know, just. Anyone who hasn't, you know, just going as a visitor to a prison, just all the you, the number of doors you have to go through and the clanking and the keys. And it's, you can read about it as, many, as much as you like, but when you just feel it and smell it and to hear the sounds, it's completely different. And I think that had, was quite transformative for us. And, and that, but that applies with all our books, that, you know, if there's a, if there's a setting somewhere, we always have to go and walk, walk there because you, you just need the three, you, you, you know, we do lots and lots of reading about things. You talk to people, but that's all. You could say that's all in two dimensions. Once you go to the place, it's in three dimensions, and you're kind of inhabiting it, and that's t totally different. One, one more thing about House of Correction, sorry, is, is that, you know, well, you know this better than anyone, but anyone who goes to even one prison, what you understand at once is that it's very rarely for people like me and Sean, that it's for people who are poor and who people who have had a raw deal. It's for people who've had bad luck. Um, you know, there's a kind of... And so all the, we weren't writing a kind of a book that was like a message about prisons. But on the other hand, it's quite shocking, that sense of, of how, how kind of... how we can be so complacent about our own luck and so unforgiving about other people's lack of luck and going into a prison that should undo that pretty quick i think with your um co-writing how regimented are you with regard to 
do you write a chapter, then he made it off down the garden, or...? Yeah, it's you know? about, well, yeah, um, I, I think there's a, we write a kind of section each, so it's not like he, that, it's the right back, if it were like half a page, that would be, the, that would be too bitty, I think, and if, on the other hand, if someone, you know, if Nikki suddenly came back and she'd written 200 pages, that would, <laughs> that would be like a kind of, well, well done, but hang on. Uh, so, I, 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 it's sort of a chapter-ish, sort of, you know, a couple of thousand words, sort of, it feels like, so we, you know, so it's constantly moving, moving back between us. Are you reluctant to let it go when you're on a roll and um, hand it over? That's or? a, no, that's a, that's a, because, I mean, that, I, I think there almost there are two states in writing. There's a kind of where you're a bit stuck, and that can be so nightmarish where it just you can't find a way through, and, and then you're not at all reluctant to let it go. That's really good, Nikki. You can you, you know time for you to solve this. But the, yeah, the great. I, I think all writers say it, <coughs> and it applies to loads of other kinds of work as well. Is it's sometimes there's a kind of flow where you think I've got this now. And then you just, you know, but, you know but, uh, and that is a great pleasure. And so the, then you can, for you, the, yes. But I think it's, you know, we have, it's very important to bat on going. And you talk about the kind of, I mean, I think that, you know, one of the great rules for any writer is to turn up. You know, it's very lovely when it's going well and inspiration strikes. But the big thing is that you have to go to your desk and be there for those ideas and you have to and, and actually as Sean says there are days where it feels like it's just a push but you have to endure that push in order to get to the kind of tug of the book once it's working properly and you have to be quite self-disciplined I mean we have different ways that we have I mean at the we don't we never argue about um I think we almost never argue. Let me not be too absolutist. We almost never argue. We argue a lot. We almost never argue about changing each other's copy and the kind of things that you would expect us to argue about. And the difficult, but we have very different writing styles. So there was one, you know, we say we don't, there was one time where we had to share an office just for various reasons. And it was revelatory for both of us. So I'm a bit kind of tyrannical. So I kind of, I was sitting there at the desk working and then Sean came in somewhat later with coffee for me, which was very nice. And then he pointed out some birds on the bird table and then he said, um, oh, what do you want to eat for lunch? And then he went out and got some more coffee, which was also very nice. And then he came back in and he said that he read out a crossword to him, <laughs> which was very companionable. But by, it was good. And then, and, and then he started saying, well, what are we going to eat for supper? And then he said, I've got the best idea. Let's learn Russian together. And at that point, <laughs> that was the last time we <laughs> shared an office together. So Sean is much more kind of suggestible to things. And that's where lots of our ideas come from. Actually, quite a lot of ideas come from Sean thinking about what our next novel might be when we're just beginning the one we're working on at the moment, which is both, which is both kind of, it kind of gets in the way, but also it's wonderful because it's like you have to be available for those ideas. So we have to respect each other's very different working styles, which is sometimes hard. Have your books been um, um, translated to foreign languages at all? Oh, yeah, yes, yeah. quite a lot. Of, I mean, I don't quite know how many. And it ebbs and flows, so some books are translated more than other books. But uh, yes, a lot. Well, I wonder how you control the... The style and, and we have no results. control. We have we we absolutely we have no. You just have to trust mm. the translator, and I'm sure they do a good job. I mean, what would it mean for us to start interrogating the Dutch translator or the <laughs> or the? Yeah. I suppose staying on a similar topic. Um, have you ever written a character who one of you really really got to like and the other really didn't? <laughs> don't, don't anyone's ever asked us that question. Really? <laughs> um, do you know what the... I mean, I'll answer in an oblique way. I think one of the straight things about um, when we did a series, because normally when we do books, just by the time anyone else responds to the characters, in a way, we've, we're, we're done with them. You know, they're in the past and we're thinking about the future. But we had a, one of the ways in which writing a series was so different was you'd write a book and then you kind of, you saw how the, re the readers reacted to characters that you were still writing. And it, I, I think, well, I certainly think that we were affected about the way we felt because of the way read, that some, you could feel that some characters didn't quite, 
you know, you weren't getting that much response, whereas others really worked. And, uh, and, and the, you know, I mean, it was a little bit, we've had the ideas that having a, having a series, because you can't, you know, you throw characters together and, you, you know, writing about them for eight years. It was a bit like inviting a whole lot of people to a party and you're not quite sure who's going to get on and who's going to have a good time mm -hmm. and who's just going to be sourly in the corner, you know. And uh, so it he, he was very much a bit like that. And, and, of course, in the case of a, what you can't do when you're giving a party, you know, in, in the series, you can kill someone off if they're not... <laughs> if you, if they're, you know, I mean, and there was a particular example there um, uh, where... Uh, uh, there was a character who appeared in the very first book who was this Ukrainian builder called Joseph who falls through the <laughs> ceiling of, of Frieda's consulting room. And he was just, we just thought he was going to do a little bit of function in that book. And it was a real case of like the part, someone who comes to a party and just won't leave and is there the <laughs> next morning. And he just was there for the whole series. He just because, he, yeah, yeah, I know. And we kind of, uh, but I mean, I think that, that the, the, but the idea of if one of us likes a character more than I think that happens a re, would happen at a really early stage, mm. and I think if we're if we're not kind of grabbed by someone, or if one of us thinks there's a real problem with a character, we would real I think we, that's the kind of discussion we're having all the time, and I think then we'd realise there's a problem with the book, you know, if something, yeah. if you know, because <clears throat> is really and the kind of what I mean the kind of conversations you have where you're writing are. I mean, I think a really dangerous thing when you're watching a film or you're reading a book, you f if you feel the writer or the director likes his character more than you do, you know, this, so you've got to think about it. It's really, or, or on the other hand, there's a danger, you know, I think you always want to have, every character should have something, even if they're really awful, they should have something. They feel they're a sympathetic character. They should, but there's a danger, of course, you know, how sympathetic do you want the villain to be, you know? And then that, that's all big. And they, sometimes that can get out of hand in some, one can think of, you know, examples. Uh, you know, uh, well, not, I won't, maybe I won't give examples. <laughs> but that's, you know. Yeah. Thank you. Kadaris. Yeah. yeah. Well. Um, we're big fans of the Frieda books, oh. and all the characters in them are so wonderful. Um, you know, I, I can't imagine that any of them would want to be... You, you could not possibly get rid of Joseph. <laughs> He's he so wouldn't go. He just no, wouldn't go. No, I'm sure he wouldn't. <laughs> He'd still be pouring the vodka. <laughs> um, uh, going back to the Frieda books, when you had that first idea about her and you knew it was going to take more than one book, um, I sort of imagined that you must have had a murder wall with all <laughs> the characters and, you know, who's going to do what because there's so many, um, yes. so many, a core of characters as well as all the other characters. Did you know when you first started talking about Frida, how the arc was going to go and how the book would end. So we, so, so for the people who haven't read the Frida stories, there's, the, there's, a, there's a story that's set off like a kind of fuse being lit in the first book, which burns its way through and then comes to, kind of, comes to a climax in the eighth book. And then underneath that arch, there are, there are eight standalone novels. So you don't need to read them in the kind of in the, in the original order. Um, so what we knew, we knew before we started writing, we knew what that arc was going to be. I mean, not in great detail. We just knew how it was going to kind of unfold itself and where it was going to end. But what we did not know, we didn't know what each of the standalones were going to be. And those we came up, they, those we worked out as we, came, as we came to them. And that was quite important because we wanted to be kind of, we wanted to be flexible and we wanted the characters to develop. And we, you know, and we knew, you know, most of the characters survive. There are a couple who don't survive. So we kind of, it was like what we, what we needed to do is we needed to have a kind of, Group of Frida's a kind of loner who's and yet she's surrounded by her kind of maid family. So we need to have an idea of them. And then also, the big thing that we talked about all the way through is, is it's the series is partly about time passing. It's a decade. What happens to someone who begins off as a teenager and ends up as an as an adult? What happens to Frida as she kind of passes through these decades? How does experience alter you and bash you about and change you. So we were very kind of careful about planning, kind of thinking that out. Mm. But we couldn't have kept... I don't think it would... We didn't want to write something that was set in stone. 
it need because it was as we were talking about earlier the best bits of writing is when writing just takes you where you didn't think you were going to it kind of drags you to unexpected places or often it does the opposite it will just refuse i mean if there's if you if you've got a problem with your writing, there's a knot we reach or a barrier if that is telling us something there is something going on there that you need to work out that's just not working and that's really important to be able to kind of listen to that you must both know Nikki French quite well by now. Um, you've written a lot of books. Uh, I wonder if you edit each other's work less now than you did when you started. Oh, good question. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, I, I don't think... No, I, th I mean, it's really quite hard to pin down. Maybe different books are different, but I, I think... I did, and the thing is, in a way, it's quite... Also, edit, editing is maybe the wrong word because we're both kind of... I think we're doing, as two people, what one writer would do anyway, which is constantly kind of changing and rewriting. And so this... this I mean, I think I was saying earlier, I think that... So, I mean, just... So apart from the fact that we hand it between us and uh, edit and change, then, uh, but, but then and we're constantly having conversations uh, while we're writing, saying, is this working? What about this? And so sometimes we'll go back at a, and, and one person will do some rewriting. And then when we get to the end, one person will go through the whole uh, will, you know, have big talk, and then one person will go through the whole book, and then the other person will go through the whole book. It's a very... It's not, it's not quicker than one person doing it, but it's probably slower in some ways. So... I mean, it's just, by the end, it's just this melange. Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit like you're saying that, you know, we've been cook, you know, we've cooked a huge casserole, and at the end, can you say that carrot was done by Sean or Nicky, you know? And I, I don't, I feel that we, that we do, I don't think we do more editing, or, or le sorry, I don't think we do less editing now than we did, but, but, but that's a really good question. I haven't really thought about it. No, it's a great question. And I, I, I think what Sean, when Sean said it depends on the book, there are some books that, and that doesn't mean they're better or worse. They come out quite clean, that you don't need to change them much. And sometimes that's because we've spent much longer, for various reasons, much longer planning them. They needed more planning, and some have to be more kind of open as we write them. So I think it more <coughs> depends on... But what I would say about editing, though, is that every writer needs an editor. And however many however many edits you do it to yourself you we still need our editor because you just don't quite know what you've got when you've written a novel it's not like writing non-fiction when you've written a novel at the end of it you you just don't know what you've got until you've got an editor and a reader to be telling you what you've got and in fact there are various writers who shall remain nameless who became who become so kind of successful and grand that they refuse to be edited <laughs> and then you can just tell that you know there have been books you you just read it and you think this has not been properly edited it just needs that kind of rigor and you all however many books you write you need an editor Sorry? How do you sign the book? Oh, we well, we, you know, we, That's our, a good question. <laughs> you know, our, originally, we had the idea that Nikki did the Nikki and I did the French. And then, but then we, we thought that was ridiculous. And now we just, I'm afraid you get both our names. Thank you so much. It was absolutely amazing. It's, it's really it's lovely, it's lovely for us. And th thank you all, you know, hugely for being here and being so warm and nice and interesting.